Christmas paints a picture of amazing joy. We, uh, when you think of Christmas and all the things that happen in the Christmas season, um, am I on? It doesn't sound like I'm on. I can't hear myself out there. yet? This on? Okay, good to go. Yeah. <laughs> okay, wondered, did I touch something back here? <laughs> All right, Christmas. Yeah, fill, filled uh, with joy. You know, when we think of the, uh, the angels singing, uh, glorifying God, the shepherds coming, and the kings or wise men coming, and, and, and there's, there's this sense of joy, this anticipation of excitement. And and yet, in reality, sometimes Christmas uh, is a hard time to feel, feel a lot of joy. Um, there's th the stuff that happens, Curtis referred to, like broken strings. But even greater for him was uh, losing his father-in-law a couple days ago, too. So, and yet, be able to come up and sing songs about joy is, uh, I hope, uplifting in the midst of uh, a difficult time. For me, this week, while well, I found out my car was written off, uh, after hitting a deer jumped out in front of me, and uh, so I found that news out and had to deal with that. So there's stuff, there's stuff that happens, right? And sometimes that stuff uh, can get in the way. Uh, and, and we sometimes wonder uh, at Christmas time, like, where's, where's the joy? This was supposed to be a season of joy, but sometimes we don't feel it. We don't know where it went. There's things that disappoint I'm thinking about the kings, too, or the, the wise men, when they made their way to see Jesus, and uh, they followed a star, and they found a stable. You know, there can be disappointments. It's like, what, what steals your joy? We're in a series uh, I'm titling The Mystery of Christmas, The Mystery in Christmas, and uh, what, one of those mysteries, I suppose, last week we talked about where's the peace, and this week, well, where's the joy? Do you feel it? Do you have it there? Maybe your experience is somewhat like this, these group parents that took their kids to get that wonderful picture with Santa Claus to put on their card to send out to all their family. <laughs> you ever received one of these cards? <laughs> uh, maybe. Yeah, sometimes life goes that way, doesn't it? Um, let me get into the story. I want to... Uh, uh, I'm good now? I'm going to move the mic up to your ear. Oh, that's why. There. The mystery is solved. <laughs> the mystery in Christmas, yes. There we go. It's my fault. <laughs> All right, where was I? Yes, the story. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1. Let's jump in there. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. So let's get some of the settings. So there's a lot packed into this one verse. First of all, it says, after Jesus was born. In fact, maybe some time after. It would have taken these kings a while or to get there, right? Uh, these magi from the east. It would have taken them some time to get there. And probably six weeks, they, we estimate. Um, so, so after at least six weeks, could have been up to two years, we'll see later, uh, sometime after Jesus was born, in, in Bethlehem, and, and there was two Bethlehems, so he had to distinguish which one it was. It says, in Bethlehem in, in Judea, and Bethlehem in Judea, uh, because there was a Bethlehem in, in Zebulun, the, the province of the tribe of Zebulun, too, and, well, that was even a bigger city. So maybe people would have thought it was the other Bethlehem, but no, it was, it was Bethlehem in Judea, and that was significant because that was the hometown of David, one of the most successful, well-known kings in, in Israel history. So it was Bethlehem in Judea. During the time of King Herod, this would be Herod the Great, uh, well-known for some of his spectacular building projects, um, I showed you a few of those a, a few weeks ago. Herod, Herod was a, a very powerful, wealthy king. Uh, anyway, while he was ruling, near the end of his rule, in fact, uh, some magi 
Magi came from the east. Magi, there's, there's some question about who these were. Traditionally, we used to call them kings, but, but some have suggested they're probably more like sorcerers, um, magicians. Uh, I, I like the wise men idea. I, I, because I just, I, you know, sorcerers could lead you in the wrong direction. And, and these guys clearly were following something and came to worship the Son of God being born. And, and I think wise men ties in really well with that concept. And they certainly were wise, as we'll see a little bit later. So anyway, these magi uh, came from the east. Uh, east of Jerusalem would be um, probably the area of Persia, Babylon. Uh, maybe, maybe these would be the places where they were coming from. And to make that journey would, would take about six weeks, 1,000 kilometers uh, on foot, uh, on camel, however they came. It'll be, it'll be uh, quite a, a distance to come. And, and so they came and, and with the uh, idea that they wanted to <clears throat> see this king because they ask, and in verse 2, it says... They ask, uh, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We, we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. So they've come uh, wanting to worship this king, the one who is born king. Born king. That's quite significant. Um, they, they didn't know what, to, what they would find. Would he, was he just born? It uh, doesn't say, but where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? Now, Israel already had a king, King Herod, right? We just talked about him. So that has an interesting twist to it, right? And he has a star. He says, we've seen his star. What, what, do you have a star? I mean, really? He's got is a star? We saw his star. How did they know that? And, and where did that come from? And we've come to worship him. We're coming, they say, we want to worship him. That's pretty significant for these guys who've tra- traveled all this way with a heart to... to you know, pay honor and do high respect to this, this new king in Israel. And so they come to Jerusalem. That was the place they expected to find the king, right, at the capital city. Uh, so they come to Jerusalem. It says, when Herod, so they start asking in Jerusalem. And it says, when Herod heard this, that they were asking about where this king was, um, well, it says that he was disturbed. You know, where is this king born? What is, a new king has been born? And this is the reference to the Messiah that been, Israel has been raiding for. And, and King Herod is probably thinking, well, am I going to be deposed? Like, what's going on here? So Herod's disturbed. And, and back, to, I haven't finished. Uh, previous, yeah. and, and all Jerusalem with him. They're, they were all uh, disturbed. They are all like, oh, no. If, and it's like, if hey, the boss is upset, then all the employees are worried too, right? They're upset too. And, and it, that, that was sort of the feeling going on in Jerusalem this time as, as people are saying, where's this king? Where, who's been born? Well, king of the Jews. Anyway, so Herod, uh, he calls, in verse 4, it says, when he called together all the, the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, all like, like the Bible scholars, you know, the people that know the Bible, and, and he asked them, where is the Messiah, where, where the Messiah was to be born? Now, that's, it's actually, to Herod's credit, that was probably a wise thing to do. All this talk of the Messiah, this king being born, where do you find out? Well, the Jews have been talking about the Old Testament, the Holy Scriptures that they had have been talking about this coming Messiah. And so he goes to the experts in the laws. Do you know, does it say where he's going to be born? And they reply. In next verse, in verse 5, it says, In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, For this is what the prophet has written. And then, to be really clear, uh, he quotes to them uh, in, from Micah chapter 5. This is what the scholars said to King Herod, quoting from My- Micah 5, 2. It says this, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, um, are by no means least among the rulers of Judea, Ju- Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. This is uh, talking about Messiah in this passage, and it actually names the place in Bethlehem, and not just one, you know, which one, but Bethlehem in the land of Judah. That's where the Messiah would be born. So Herod, once he gets this information, says in verse 7, then Herod called uh, the Magi secretly. Uh, He doesn't want other people in on this conversation, so he secretly calls them in and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He wanted to know, when did you see this star? 
Because he's thinking in his head, how long has this king been around? How long has he been born? So he calls them in to find out the exact time. And then it says, he sent them to Bethlehem and said, well, go and search uh, carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Now, if you know the rest of the story, you know that that is a lie, outright lie. He had no intentions of worshiping this new king. He was going to kill and destroy. In fact, we're not going to read that far in the passage, but later on, after the, the wise men leave, that Herod actually sends soldiers in to kill all the babies two years and under in Bethlehem. How horrible is that? Uh, <clears throat> so, so at some point, when he asks the exact time, it must have been somewhere between about six weeks and two years, and somewhere in that neighborhood, they saw a star, and they come to worship him. Anyway, <clears throat> after they, uh, it says, after they had heard uh, the king, uh, the, these uh, magi went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And this is where we get the sense that, that this was maybe more than a regular star. This, this star was able to guide them to the very house and how that was possible, how it lined up. Maybe it was a supernatural event. <clears throat> and, uh, and then it says, when they, in verse next verse, it says, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed like they were just in the in the uh, greek it's just it's like joy joy double joy uh, it's overjoy filled with joy over the top spilling over with joy they were excited because the star had reappeared it was guiding them they'd come all this way and now it was here <clears throat> to show them right the path right to the last spot they're on track god was directing them again and so when they get to that house, it says, on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother. Now, this is interesting because it's no longer a stable and a baby. It's a child and his mother, which would tend to make us think that it is maybe closer to the two years, right? So, so they see the child and his mother. And Mary, uh, and they saw not only the, the child, but Mary, his mother Mary. And, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Interesting response, right? That's what they said they were coming to do. They were coming to worship him, and they do that. They bow down, worship him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Uh, valuable. And in fact, these are probably the gifts that sustain them because after, uh, later on in the story, again, we won't get to that latter part of the story, but um, they... they Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus had to, had to flee and were on the run and lived as fugitives for a while. And, and this is probably what sustained them uh, and kept them for a while. Gold, gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So <clears throat> then it says, interesting in the last verse I want to read, in verse 12, that has to do with these magi, it says, And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to, the, to their country by another route. So somehow they have this dream, we can't go back, even though Herod asked us to come back to him, we're not going to go that way. And he leads them, uh, he leads them by another route. So as I look at this story, focusing on the Magi, I, I see three mysteries, three things that we, we, we don't really have good explanations for We've guessed at them, and uh, I have. But here are the three mysteries. First of all, how, how did the Magi, how did they, how, how the Magi knew that following a star would lead them to a king? Like, how did they know that? And, and I, I addressed this mystery a couple of years ago, and we talked about the star, and we talked about these guys coming from the east, and we do know that in Israel's, Israel's history, about 400 years earlier, Israel as a nation had spent 70 years in the east, in the land of Babylon, when they were captured, their country was captured by the Babylonians, and they'd lived 
in that country. And so there was probably a great deal of history. Many of the Jews came back. Some even stayed in the East. So maybe they were descend Jewish descendants or, or connected. Or we, don't, we don't know. There's no history. But, but clearly there was some past evidence. You t tie that together with the uh, prophecy in Genesis 49 about the star in Judah. And, and you start to put some pieces together that maybe there was, maybe there was uh, some, some expectation from these uh, scholars, uh, maybe even Jewish roots, or they'd heard from the Jews that, that caused them to come. But we don't know. We don't know. So, so that's one of the mysteries. Another mystery is that I find quite fascinating is this, that the Magi were willing to travel a great distance to see this newborn king, yet the religious leaders in Jerusalem didn't even make the short trip to Bethlehem. I'm, I'm astounded by that. Right? The Bible scholars, the, the king would be born, and there's all this talk, and where's the new king? We've seen his star. And they don't even make the trip. They don't go down and see him. Nothing. And, and they're only, what, six kilometers away? And these other guys have traveled a thousand kilometers to see Jesus. I, I don't know, it's surprising to me. And, and, then the, and then the other mystery, I guess, in this is why the wise men were overjoyed rather than disappointed when they got there. I mean, he wasn't in Jerusalem. He was in this town of Bethlehem. Poor family. You know, he had been laid in a, a manger. He, they didn't have much. And, and, then, and then they show up, and yet there's no sign of disappointment. In fact, they're filled with joy. They're bowing down and worshiping, giving him gifts. It, 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 it makes me wonder, well, why is that? You know, they are expecting the king of the Jews. This would be, no doubt, in Jerusalem, and there'd be all the fanfare related to it, right? And they were just going to join the party, and there's none of that. And yet, when they came, they were still overjoyed with, with that. And so I, I want to uh, just walk through and make a few observations, actually nine observations, just about where that joy may have come from. Just some things about joy. Because here's the thing. Maybe you're struggling with joy. There's been stuff happening in your life, maybe greater than breaking a guitar string or you know, losing your car. Or maybe there's stuff maybe there's, that's been stealing you from the joy in your life. And I just wonder if, if, if there's something we can take home today that would just help us say, yeah, I need to get joy back into my life. So here's, here's some things that may have contributed to, to their feeling of joy. Now, first of all, is a sense of accomplishment. I, re, I relate to this one. Maybe this is more me than actually in the Bible, but I'm thinking these guys actually traveled a long way. They found and accomplished what they came to do. And, and isn't that, doesn't that feel good when you accomplish something? When you, when you set out, that's why when they saw the star again, it's like, ah, we can finish this. We're almost there. And, and that sense of accomplishment feels good. It brings joy in. When we finish something, you start. Understand, I have never run a marathon uh, and don't plan to either. But I know there are some of you that like to run marathons or half marathons even. And, 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 and it's grueling, it's hard, and it takes a lot of time and training. But there's a joy, there's a feeling, a sense of accomplishment that, that comes with something like that. And you felt that. You, you've got a hobby or joy or even work, something you're working on. And, and when you come to the finish line, it just feels good, doesn't it? It just brings joy. And so maybe that's it. Maybe there's stuff, there's unfinished stuff in your life you need, you need to bring to an end. You've got too many loose ends, too many unfinished tasks, and it's just overwhelming you. Well, pick one. Maybe the simplest one. Get it done because that will help to bring joy back in. Because there's joy in accomplishing, in accomplishment. And I, I think that was related to, to their feeling, too. The second one is, they, is their choices. They made some wise choices, and, and this is a big one, because uh, joy often comes when you make wise choices. When you make bad choices, there is, there is stress, there is regrets, there's, you, you know, because we've all made good choices and bad choices. You know the difference. These guys made a series of good choices. They, they chose to take the time out of their schedules to make this trip to see Jesus. They, they followed the star. They, they asked, stopped and asked for directions along the way. Um, they, they got guidance from God. They, and they didn't show up just empty-handed. They made, had enough wisdom to, to pack some, something to honor him with. And, and so I just see all these 
wise choices they made along the way. Because life works better that way. We, we know when you make wise decisions, the, the joy quotient goes up in your life. <clears throat> Isn't that true? Don't you wish that you were a little bit wiser? I suspect everyone would say, yeah, I wish. And the person next to you would definitely wish you were a little bit wiser, right? I mean, it's true. We all wish we were a little more like that because wide choices leads to, to freedom and, and joy and, and, and less regrets and less pain. So, yeah, wise choices. I, I think we see they made a few wise choices, and, and perhaps that led to their, their feeling of joy. A third one is their generous, generous heart. As I said, they, they brought some gifts uh, that had a significant impact for a family that maybe didn't even... I mean, they were, they were dirt poor anyway, I think, at that time, and, just the fact that they, Jesus was born in a, in a barn. But, but imagine receiving those gifts, and it was significant, especially in light of they were going to be on the run for the next couple of years. Um, this would be very, and, and their generous heart. You know, you ask a kid at Christmas, what's the Christmas all about? And you hope they say, well, it's Jesus' birthday. But what they usually say is, Presents, yeah, that's right. The presents, because they like to get, you know, they, they, it's, a, it's about presents, it's about getting. But as you get older, you realize actually the joy comes more in, in giving than getting. Right? There's, there's a, a joy in that. And, and some of my favorite memories, my biggest one I remember is when <clears throat> I had been fortunate enough to find a neighbor that had one of those, those electric cars that you can drive in. And he, he, he had put it, the battery was dead and it was, wasn't, you know, and, and so he wasn't, his kids had grown up. And my son loved, Jordan loved cars. And I thought, wouldn't that be an amazing gift? So I went over and he gave the thing to me. I just had to put a new battery in it. And it was his Christmas present. And then he came down and saw that. It was like, wow, it was like, his, I'll never forget. You know, it was like, yeah, those are the cool moments, right? Those memories when you, you do something and, uh, yeah, and because and, and, generous generosity brings joy, right? It breeds joy. You, you've learned that over the years. That when, when you give, uh, not just to your kids, even to others, when you, when, you, when you develop that generous spirit, it brings a whole wave of joy into your life. And I think that that, that was part of what they experienced in giving those gifts to Jesus. <clears throat> and the fourth one. The fourth one is, is the godly perspective that uh, the godly perspective that they felt, like I've, I've been reading a little bit lately, and, and, and um, one of the things that we're discussing is when we, when we see things, we're, we're looking through a lens of our own perspectives. Like we, you've heard, you know, color, you know, people wear rose-colored glasses, or, you know, we see things from our point of view, and that's why people will observe something, even like the war in the Middle East, and we'll see it from two completely different angles, right? Because we're, we're viewing the events through our own perceptions and the way we want to see things, right? We see things not the way they are, but how we perceive them, right? Or, and, and, and social media is really big in this, right? We, it, it twists us. <clears throat> so what I was thinking as I was thinking about that, wouldn't it be amazing if we could see things not from our perspective or social media's perspective or the news or whatever, but if we could see things and events from God's perspective, how that would change? You know, Jesus came to, to increase the joy factor in our life. He said things multiple times like, I, I say this, that your joy might be complete. And, and I think, you know, Jesus, Jesus wanted to see more joy in our lives. And yet, um, stuff happens. Uh, someone told me this week, they said, you know, you can't always trace his hands, but you can trust his heart. You know, and, and that may be true. We can't, always, we can't always trace God's hand. We can't always figure out why stuff happens, but we know he has the best for us. And, and these guys... These um, magi, when they were making the trip, they knew something significant was going to happen. I mean, this star just shows up. They, f they feel inclined to go, and, and it shows up again and leads them right to the... They, they knew something significant. God was directing them, and they wanted to be a part of that, and they wanted to see what God was doing. 
even, even if other people around didn't understand, other people looked at that maybe and said, oh, it's just a baby. They knew God was up to something. And when we have God's perspective, when we can see things through God, I, there's no doubt the joy is going to increase in our life because that's what God's heart for us. Uh, a fifth one, the fifth thing I, I observed that could be a factor in this is their humility. And it says that they came uh, and, and saw the child, they, they, bent, they bowed down and worshipped. They, they bowed down. Uh, that's... that's kind of an interesting thought, isn't it? I mean, to bow down in front of a baby or a child, a young child at this point, it, really? You know, they, they'd come to Jerusalem expecting to see the king, and they end up in Bethlehem, you know, and a child. And, and I think that in itself just sort of strips away the arrogance and the pomp and just it gives you a perspective of the kind of God that we, we serve that doesn't need ever the big stuff. And that humility, and even these, these, wise, these wise men that came obviously had, obviously had some means and some finances and pretty well off to bring these kind of gifts, and yet they weren't too arrogant, they weren't too big to bow down before a child and, and to uh, worship him. So I think this... You know, and then nothing kills joy. You, you see it in others all the time. You can't see it in yourself, but you see it in others all the time, right? You see arrogance, and it just, it just is a turn off. You know, it's not... It's when, but then that's stripped away. You can experience the joy in a relationship. A sixth one is that it says they bow down and worship. So this idea of a heart of worship... Um, they, 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 I don't know how, we don't know how they worship. Maybe they sang. Maybe they, um, maybe they chanted something or they prayed and, or celebrated. I mean, we're not sure how they worship, but, but there's something emotional, isn't there, about singing? And especially when you sing a joyful song, uh, it moves your emotion. And that's maybe why we sing. Because we want to feel that joy, and it helps bring about when your favorite song comes on the radio, or you know, or you you want to lift your spirits and you play something you know that's going to get pick you up again. Because there's there's something about worshiping or music and that just lifts your spirits. And so they came and they worshipped him. They worshipped that king, and it filled their hearts with joy. And then uh, <clears throat> seventh one. Seventh possibility is here they are, uh, is the idea of flexibility. Because, see, they, they came on the sort of the direct route to get to Bethlehem, and then they were told to go back another way. Some people, that would really upset them. Dream or no dream, right? It's like, I, I have my certain way of doing things. We've always done things this way. That's why we call people sometimes crabby old people, right? This is this idea of flexibility. You know, they won't change. They crab... And it kills creativity, right? And, and, and so you just see their flexibility. Oh, I missed one, didn't I? Following God. You're all out there thinking, oh, he missed number seven. Okay, following God. I'll go back to it. <clears throat> yeah, that's my second mistake today already. What's going on? <clears throat> okay, so following God. So th they're following the star, and it, this is, it said that when they saw that again, they were just overjoyed. That's where that uh, overjoyed came in. And they're just, they're just uh, all excited because, you know, following God and doing, following God's ways just brings joy into your life. It's the way God designed us and wants us uh, to live. It's His plan uh, that our joy might be complete. And then, and so I mentioned that, and then flexibility, okay, we've talked about that, uh, you know, it can, it can kill, right, it can kill creativity and joy if we choose not to be flexible in situations. And they were willing to say, God, you want to go a different way? I'll, I'll go that way. We'll go that way home. And the final one is finding Jesus. I think this is sort of the climax. When they find, found Jesus, it's like, yes, here he is. And there's something in their heart that's just... Uh, this is the newborn king. And they gave him the gifts. They worshiped him. They bowed down. and They found Jesus. And this is significant. I've seen this in a couple of people recently. I had a, a guy walked into church here. 
Actually, it was when the kids' program was going on a Wednesday morning, and they directed them to me, and I got in touch with him. Uh, <clears throat> he was a, a Muslim guy that uh, wanted to know about Jesus, and he's, uh, and, and he's kind of dedicated his life to Jesus. He's, he, and he's joined our, my small group uh, that I have on Thursday nights, and it's like, you it just, it's cool to see somebody come to know and find Jesus in their life. Or another letter I got from one of our online people that just uh, is all excited. They've come to faith in Jesus and, and, and very excited about growing in Him and been emailing back and forth. And we, so you, you read these letters and you, you meet these people. It's like, oh, yeah, they found Jesus. They, they know the joy. They found that joy in finding Jesus. And, and that's what I would want us to live in. Uh, there are so many things in life, and so many factors that steal away our joy and disappointment. But God wants us to come to Him and, and renew that. And, and maybe going through these nine, they say, yeah, that's what's sapping me. This one here is getting me. This one's pulling me away. Or this is what I need to do to bring back some of the joy in the season. Because this is what God would want for you. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I thank you, for, uh, thank you for this reminder, a simple story um, at a very significant moment in history. When you stepped into this world and you poured joy into these travelers from afar, into their life, um, when they met you as a baby <laughs> many years ago, Lord, I just... I would just pray that as we meet with you, uh, whether daily or maybe for the first time, God, that you would pour joy into our lives. That we would remove those things that are stealing our joy and focus on what you're doing. And remember that, that you are the joy giver and that you uh, want that for us. Thank you for uh, the relationship that we can have with you, the almighty, powerful God. And with joy, we, we, uh, we celebrate in our hearts your sons coming into this world. In Jesus' name, amen.